All right, I've got the mic on and we're recording. So now we'll go back to here. All right, so this is all about eliminating your job, which is weird because you're in school, right? To get a job, to eliminate the job. So that's like a, a brainstorm that we're gonna have today. And it is possible, I do it all the time. I get rid of my job and you know what the best part about that is? The next day I show up and I do something completely different. So the good news is, if you like challenges and you wanna keep doing new things, this is a great way of doing that. If you don't like doing new things, you just wanna keep doing the same thing over and over and over every day, which is what some people like. Like, they keep doing it over and over. This is not about that, right? This is about doing something new. So that's the motive for why we're here today. So before we get started with that, I'm gonna go a little bit over the, the homework, which I think everybody did. Welcome, let's see here. All right, so, so I'll admit this tripped me up. Uh, I have it muted. Okay. All right, so, so I got tripped up, so I'm gonna show you what tripped me up, and then uh, I'll go over uh, homework that someone else submitted that's more along the lines of what I was thinking. So, anybody's got a speaker on? Oh, you know what it is? Okay. I'm not sure where the sound control is. Okay. So, I already gave you the ability to load in this Panda's uh, data frame, so that's sort of convenient, right? And I tell you how big it is. And if you look at it, and you're cruising through here, like, yeah, it looks like data, right? Like, let's just rerun all of this. So we'll do that, and that, and that. Okay, so once that's loaded in, I'm gonna give it this transpose part. Rerun that, all right. You look through here, and, and the way that I went about analyzing this data set was I looked at all these column names, and I said, do any of these column names look like they're sort of a, a group of columns. And so, not really, I mean like, you know, there's there's the, so some people thought about like east, north, maybe like those are different things that could be joined, right? And, and like, that was really the approach of analysis um, that I was thinking about. But what someone found and pointed out to me um, is that this entry right here is a list. And if you look through all of that column, and then let's see if we can pull up another example here. Let's see if we can, right, let's make it a little bigger. I'm gonna pick up the first 30 rows instead of the first 10 adding a default. Let's go back over to waste type. Yeah, so here, here's a, so the first row happens to be a list, which is convenient because we're looking at the head. And then if you look a little bit further down, there's another list here, right? And so what that tells you is there is, um, so every, column is a variable and every row is an observation, but the other sort of feature that you're supposed to look for in tidy data is to figure out, do I have an element that is a list? And if you do, then maybe what you wanna do is break this out into multiple rows. So they're all um, with the same entries except for this broken out into different rows. Does that make sense? It's, it's a little complicated and it might not be immediately obvious why you'd want to do that, but if you think about, well, what is the variable that I have here, right? And that's waste type, I believe. And so you wanna treat waste type as sort of like a categorical variable. And so if you think about the elements of those categories, it's the elements of the waste type, so it might be like brick. And so what you wouldn't wanna think of it as like, if I have a list of all the waste types as my elements, then some other list that um, has brick as like the second element wouldn't be considered the same category, right? But by separating out a list into a separate set of rows, then you can treat it as single entries in a column. Not sure whether that conveyed anything of news to anybody, but so the, 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 the tripping point on this first data set was column contains a list, the list should be expanded into individual rows. Right, so, so the way that pandas tells you that the thing in the cell is a string is by telling you it's an object. And so let's, this doesn't present it as a list, right? Because pandas read it in and said, oh, this is all just one giant string. And so it's left to the human to figure out that this is a string of sort of entries separated by semicolons in this case. 
and there's no sign of a code to, to look at all the objects to make sure they're not lists. So, so, you, so you could sort of like think of, well, commonly lists are strings separated by a comment and a space. Right? Or maybe they're separated by a pipe. Right? And so they get back to this delimiter question of like, what's the right delimiter? That's be exhaustive to try and figure out what all the possible delimiters are. And so like, in this case, it happened to be a semicolon with no space. So even if you had searched for a semicolon space, you'd miss it. Right? So like, the, the inconsistency of human, like, you can sort of see why a human would do this. right? Like, for this entry in that row, they have all these different waste types. So it, it makes sense from a human entry point. But it makes the analysis on the data science harder. Hey, Tristan, you had something? Yeah, so your, your new variables would be fake, right? Complicated. Well, the new cell and so the waste types column would be the same. But you'd have, so in this case, you have uh, one, like, two, three, four, mm -hmm. five rows. And the, and the messy thing, right, from a sort of a human analysis perspective is this first row, like, oh, I'm just going to stop. Stop down. Okay. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> All right. So Carver, sand, and gravel, right? Carver, sand, and gravel. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's the tricky part, is that it wouldn't look very sensical from a human perspective, because there's a bunch of almost duplicate rows. You have to be cautious, though, because maybe separating that out isn't what the customer actually wants. That's over. So, so that's no matter what, because the way we attack the data is convenient to us. Yeah, so that, that's a good distinction. So it's like, a tidy representation is typically not what the customer wants to see, right? Like, like, okay. Well, for our purposes, most of our tools are written to handle tidy data. And so, yes, you know, when you present, so it might be the case that you get some untidy data, you make it tidy, you do all your analysis, and then you put it back in that original compact formulation that the customer provided it to you, right? And so, like, it would be not unreasonable to think about how to transform it back to the original structure or something also compact. So but so it, it, it's a, a thing that I miss. So that's why I, I think I detected one point when people miss that. So it's a subtle subtle feature. <laughs> I so my superficial analysis, I looked at the columns and said, these columns all look good to me. Good to go. <laughs> so yes, got me. <laughs> I get me. All right, so that was like uh, data set number one. That was like the unfortunate sticking point that I didn't realize. Okay, so then more commonly, um, people were um, sort of going through, sort of doing that same analysis of, yep, look good, it's good to go. All right, so that's, so I've, I'm gonna post both of these two notebooks. The first one is the one with like the, the find of that. And then, so like the, the consequence of that little like, oh, that's a list, I should clean that up, right? It's a lot harder to clean up. So the the technique of converting from a string in that column to a set of rows with a single entry has more work than I intended. So, all right. The let's see, other sort of so the other major mistake that I, I I probably didn't I didn't realize this was causing confusion in advance. So like the fact that the word tidy is colloquially the you know in Kahneman language tidy and clean are synonyms. So not that they're equivalent sort of words, right? But in a data science context, the word tidy has a very specific meaning. Right? So, so if you cleaned the data, it's not a bad thing, right? It's just part of the assignment. So. I think in that article that you referenced in the email, he actually said below the five books yeah. from an error. Yeah. I think he actually didn't distinguish between tidy and clean. Okay. But so, so you'd want to tidy the data in order to clean it. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah but, yes. both, but both functions make for tidy data. Cleaning the data? Cleaning it and then cleaning it. <laughs> so that's why I went from tidy to clean. All right. I will review that. Uh, it's important. <laughs> I want to be correct. All right. So those will be posted. Um, does anybody have any questions while I'm up? Run my mouth. Okay. If you had questions or like curiosity, like why did I decide that this was a variable versus not a variable? That's something I'm totally willing to go over because it's it's important to understand the sort of the rationale. Another sort of like I think in the one of the bottom data sets, people are asking like, should I merge these phone cells or like 
or the, the phone numbers or should I merge the first name, last name, right? And so like for each thing, it's sort of like a, it's a choice. And, you know, it, it always depends on like what your analysis is going to be, but some common questions. Can you melt an object into one? Um, right. Or does it have to be a number? No, nothing specific about it being an object. Okay. okay. So, as a reminder, uh, I'm just I'm I'm going to be revisiting this over and over and over in the semester, and you'll like be so bored. And you're like Ben, why are you wasting your time? We're paying significant tuition for this, and it's because I don't want you to fall into this trap, right? So the trap is, you have a question on the homework. There's a, you know, your, your, your well-known classmate who's a brilliant data scientist is sitting next to you. It's so tempting to just reach out and ask a simple question about the assignment. My advice is do not do that. And as tempting as it is, and as easy as it is, just don't do that, right? It's, it is a higher barrier to come talk to me, right? There's some of these power dynamics going on, and like there's a sphere of like interacting with the instructor, which is totally weird. But come talk to me in person or via email and, and, and pose your question, right? So like that is my advice to you. It'll save you lots and lots of heartache. Right. So we're, we're roughly at, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I just I was I was saying that it ex the second one exists and was the more common sort of like just acknowledging that it is tidy but it's wrong and there's not much to see there. Okay. So we're like a third of the way through the semester, which means we're gonna have a project coming up. Everybody's excited, right? So if you have no idea what's going on with this project, that's totally reasonable. It's the first one. The good news is you sort of understand this first project, the second and third projects built on the same sort of process. And so like you'll be applying the same techniques you learn in project one to project two. And then for project two, there'll be a little bit of additional work. And then for project three, you'll be applying everything you did in project one and two and a little bit more. And right? so it's worth understanding project one and doing it well because you're going to be applying those exact same techniques to the next data set. Right? I'm trying not to surprise you. Right? The principle of least surprise is don't be surprised. It's coming. Right? So learn this well. You'll be using it again. No, 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 no. Yeah, bigger and and harder data sets. Okay, be done. So uh, in class, when class starts next week, then I will be. Random selecting students. So that means that, right, the consequences you have to prepare in advance in case you get what work. And it's, it's a good recommended idea to prepare. So you could be randomly selected three times in a row. You don't get removed from the pool. Okay. Everybody presents to the final. Uh, that is not the case. Random. Okay, you go and then. So you should definitely not do a PowerPoint. It is just talking through your notebook. So it's, it's the work you did, you know, explaining why did I do this, what decisions did I face, you know, what did it help what I got. So it's just the notebook. So that's it, right? So we don't have to prepare that much. If yeah, yeah, yeah. The notebook, then we can it's, it's mental <laughs> preparation, right? <laughs> so, so this is so true, true life story. Yeah. The preparation that my advisor taught me in school is you could always present to your teddy bear in your bedroom on your bed, right? That is your first audience member, and if you can present to your teddy bear and explain, to, you know, whatever, what's a good teddy bear name like? Robert. You present to Robert, and you talk to him for like, what is it? Did I say eight to ten minutes? I think I. Yes, I did. All right. So, so you talk to Robert, the, the teddy bear on your bed, for eight to ten minutes, and you'll be like, "Wow, that's a long time," or "Wow, that's not very long at all." I don't know which one of those is going to be, but once you talk to Robert, you'll understand what that's like. All right. So, running through the presentation in your head is is worth doing, but it's not the same as talking out loud for eight minutes. Okay. Yeah, Tristan. Uh, well, so we have an, uh, well, let's say an hour and 20 minutes, that's right, yeah, 120 minutes, and let's say 10 minutes for like 12 students, and there's 26 of us, so half. One in, one in two chance of being picked. Two questions, that class is only presentation? Yes, for project one. The second question is that the group is present still on the day. Right. 
So, so that gives you an option. So here's the good, here's the good news, right? So like you get to present your notebook as it is developed by you. And then during that session, you'll be like, wow, that's some insightful analysis that I should include. Right? Like, <laughs> so learn something, right? Like pay attention and then be like, ah, I can use that. <laughs> right. All right. Good question. Anything else on the product? That's it. Yeah. Will people be asking questions? They should. I would encourage that. So you. You will be asking questions. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so I try and remain engaged, right, through the presentations because they're all sort of like the same format. I did this. I did this. I did this. And so like I try and ask questions. I also suggest holding questions until the end. So it's sort of like maybe as as speakers, you're not ready to handle the sort of like dynamic back and forth questions. So I do recommend holding the questions until the end. And, you know, as an audience member, you can write something down if you want to remember it. So definitely asking questions is awesome. The, the, the value is that the speaker understands this is what people did understand or needs explanation or like they have curiosity about the data. So all of that engagement is very good. And I will be asking questions. I will be uh, telling people that when they have one minute left and when they're stopped. So I will, I will stop. Like, I'm not going to let you go for 20 minutes. It's a heads up, right? I will stop you and then physically drag you off the stage. Jessica. Yes. <laughs> You're committing to definitely going. OK. Yes, Vincent. So that's one option. Or you can bring your laptop up here, and then there's a VGA or HDMI plug -in. So, so if you want, this would be a great opportunity before this, before we leave tonight, you can come up here and like plug in your cable, plug in your laptop, see if it works with this, right? Because backup is you send your notebook to me and I present it it's on my computer, but you still present it. Oh, uh, like we can tell you to scroll down and things like that. No, 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 no. You'll be up here using my computer. No, I hear. But you said that the backup just sends you the notebook and then you can see it. On this computer, but I'll be sitting over there. You You're driving my computer, as dangerous as that is. It's an expensive old laptop, right? <laughs> okay. Well, one last question around. And everybody's feeling confident and psyched up. You can tell. <laughs> All, right. All right. So this is like my, my favorite intro slide of like when you get into the real world, you'll either have been an intern or you'll have access to interns, and like you'll sort of be able to relate to that. So when I say intern, I mean like some un underpaid or unpaid, you know, college student or high school work study person who's at your place of business, hopefully not to just get coffee, right? I mean like you want to ask them what useful work. So the the first um, sort of response I get when I say like we should automate things is, oh, I can get a human for me, and I'll be like, no, you missed the point, right? So the the goal is to not have to use these humans and. And if they're free, what's the downside, right? Like, they're free. You can just give them a bunch of work, and they'll do it. And they're motivated to look good as interns. Comment from just. All right. We, got, <laughs> we have our first downside, which is <laughs> they take direction and attention, right? So like, your most valuable asset at your work is probably your time, right? not your looks. Well, for me, anyways. So. So they still take up floor space, and yes, you can have them work from home, right? And they still take computers, and they could bring their own, but they definitely take attention. And so, as Jessica was mentioning, you have to talk to them. You have to explain the problem. You have to say why the results are important. Say, no, that's wrong. You do this, right? Like it's just a whole time sink, which maybe is the goal of interns is to educate them, but hard to get work done. Another great option: you can do all the work yourself, right? So if you don't want to delegate it out to other people, you'll do it yourself, and and. That's a lot of problems, right? So <laughs> there's this whole sequence of steps. The cool news is we can automate a lot of this, right? We can we can make your job faster, make you more productive, make you look like an amazing person. So so that's and and so even if you just are doing a work once, that's cool, but it's more likely that you'll have monthly reports or weekly reports, you know, or like you have all these reports between all these different customers. And so what you really care about is the fact that there's a recurring task. When there's a recurring task, it's like inside one, automate. Right? Like you see it's happening again and again, then you invest in time. Okay. 
So <laughs> we're going to cover a crazy amount of ground this, this, this class, and, and it's going to go really fast. And the good news is all of the notebooks that we're going to cover in class will be in Blackboard. So if you didn't understand a notebook or you're like, wow, how did Ben do that? That's super weird. It'll all be available. And like this is this is the one that makes me most excited, by the way, is like you can send an email from a notebook. It's like a that should be exciting, right? Think of how many emails you'll probably send throughout your work career, right? Twenty a day, you know, two hundred and fifty days a year for twenty years. That's a lot of emails, right? What if we could automate a portion of that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Lots of emails. <laughs> <laughs> I have so unfortunately the answer is no, but that's a different issue. <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. So, so this again, if you see something happening over and over, and there's a lot of people doing it, maybe you should automate it. But like that didn't really happen too much before the industrial revolution. So that's sort of like where you can sort of think of this mindset as taking place, right? We had masses of humans working on things, right? So that's unfortunate. And you'd think, well, maybe we got computers, right? Computers are good at doing math, but think of where computers came from, right? The first application of the word computers was for a human doing computation. That's the first application of the word computer to people, right? And so what is this a picture of? It's the computing division. It just sounds like there's a business, right, that has a computing division of people doing computations. And, so just the, and, and notice, oh, wait, there aren't any males, though. They're all women. They hired a bunch of women to do a bunch of math. So that's like a business decision. Um, you can read about the history there. Um, and, the, and the trick was you'd have like these white male mathematicians doing really complicated calculations. And then those calculations could be decomposed and then sent to these women who would be doing simple arithmetic over and over and over. So now we have laptops. <laughs> that's a big step. Okay. So if you want to learn like a little bit of uh, you know, history and also watch a good movie. This is a movie I can actually endorse uh, covering the women working at NASA. So before they sent uh, computers to the moon, they sent people to the moon using humans. So that should be pretty amazing, right? It's, okay, so that's that's a really good movie. Okay, so where have we gotten since then, right? So that, now we no longer have computers doing the work of humans. We have computers beating humans at that work. Right, so like a big test of that was this, what was it, 1997, 23 years ago. So this computer was playing chess against this guy, and this guy happens to be the best chess player that humans can produce. So they've gone from like not knowing how to do much simple mathematics to beating the best humans we have in a certain game. But that, that's a huge leap in the span of like what, a couple decades, right? And so that's that's the how much power are we leveraging here? That much power. Like we can we can automate complicated things using these, these tools. All right, so this is now the part where you've read the article, right? <laughs> Maybe. The boss told you to do a thing, and then realize that you weren't doing that thing, even though the, the, the outcome was accomplished, but you weren't actually you know, pressing the right keys on the keyboard. That's sort of like what the, the misdirection comes down to. Anybody, anybody else? Yeah. I don't know the yeah. 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 So it's a service based company that's still running. If we automate anything, that's less billing for service based. So it's a loss. So it's the, the so either we do some automation as well, but we don't implement it to the client. That would be internal. So, so yeah, like we don't want to make money and we don't want to. Right. So the point there is you're on a contract and you have billable hours, and if you were to automate something and save time, you wouldn't be able to earn as much money. Okay, right? This is totally common. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, so doing your doing your job is fully a subjective analysis by a boss. <laughs> so I love the conversation. We're going to continue on. You guys are fully welcome to talk about this, but. All right, so that's the point of the article, is to think about the morals and sort of ethics of this of this country. All right, so I'm going to try and help you think about the audiences for automation. So it's, you know, it's a little bit different than you might think. So, right, I'm super lazy. As I've warned you before, <laughs> I try not to do it. And so, like, the way that I think about this is if I see something going on, I wonder if I can automate it. That is like a default bad trait. So when you're doing things repeatedly, that's definitely like a trigger. Okay. So why would I want to automate things, right? Not just because I'm lazy, but to able be able to sort of show value to my organization. And so the easy sort of example of this is suppose you're a new data scientist. No one trusts you. No one knows what your skills are. No one knows why they would talk to you. Right? So how do you get over that issue? How do you break into a scene, right? How do you break into an environment where I want to be able to have people know that I'm the right person to talk to for topic X. And one way is to say, hey, what do you, can you tell me what you do? I'm new here, right? And then they describe something to you and you're like, oh, well, oh, you do that every day? That's a repeated task? I could help you automate that. Right? So like providing value to someone can be as simple as identifying where you can help them and then doing that free labor, right? That's not something typically they can do themselves. Typically office workers have no idea the fact that they're clicking on this button 10,000 times is a repetitive task, right? Yeah, they know that, but <laughs> they don't know how to automate it. Okay, so you have to show up and you can you can demonstrate some skills. So that's the, the underlying motive for why we're doing the homework this week. We're gonna do a homework that's a little bit complicated and it's basically to this point. Yes, no, there is homework this week. <laughs> I know, I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Yes, there is homework, yes. <laughs> All right, so here's the problem, right? You show up and you're, you're helping someone automate their job. What do they hear? They hear threat, right? They, 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 fear, they feel fear. And so the, the problem is once you start trying to demonstrate value in removing someone's job, they see that as a threat. Because a lot of people don't like learning new things, right? A lot of people just like doing something very comfortable, they know what's going to happen the next day. They know that if they come into work the next day, that's exactly what they're going to do. That can be very comforting. So what you show up as, the new person who's trying to help, is help remove their job, right? So you got to have to figure out how to like sell your pitch, right? You have to sell this fact that I have some skills, I can help you out, and no, it's not a job threat. Like, that's up to you. That's this totally subjective thing. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> the other danger is that people realize Oh, Ben, the new data scientist, he can do things that are really simple and, and we'll just send him all the like the terrible work that no one wants to do, right? Like if you if you fall into that trap, people just sending you the mundane tests. Like sometimes you can automate some of them, but often there's like little bottlenecks where it does take a human and then you end up being the stucky of the, the person who's responsible for the, the mundane work. So try and make sure that when you show up to provide value, you also have an exit strategy. All right. So basically, you can help other people. You can help yourself. So somebody there. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that you've already been doing automation and you just haven't realized it. And this is like a weird thing to think about. So we'll try and sell you on the idea. All right. <laughs> the reason that you're able to do anything in data scientists is because you have computers, you have pandas, you have data frames, right? What does that really mean? It's a set of things to make your job easier. They recognize that there's a repetitive task of say. Loading a data, loading CSVs into pandas. That's a repetitive task. So let's make a command that does that. And so all this sort of the tools you've been using so far, they're all basically automation. So I'm going to make the claim that before we had all the pandas and before we had Python and before we had Jupyter, people were programming computers. And you're like, wait, how did you program computers before there were languages? It's a reasonable question. How do you how do you tell a computer to do something? Well. Again, you hire a bunch of women to move around cables on the switchboard. And you're actually programming the computer by moving cables around on a giant board of electronics. 
Okay, nobody's here done that, obviously, right? So <laughs> you're so used to typing in a, a keyboard the thing that you want the computer to do that you don't even realize that someone else came before you and automated something. Right? That that should be amazing. So what is it that's going to happen? You're going to automate something. Someone behind you won't even recognize the fact that, that is automated. You will not even recognize the work you're doing now as automation because it's just the thing you do. But all the sort of abstraction layers are automation. Okay. Why do we do that? Well, <laughs> so that we can actually do the thing we want, right? Typically, you don't actually want to sit there all day typing on the keyboard, entering little Python commands, right? That's not I mean, well. So for some of us, it is the joy of life, but often it's for a paycheck or like to food, eat food or whatever, right? Like, so if you can automate something. It allows you to focus on what you want to do. So the really tricky part is figuring out uh, what is so common that we should not do it. So once we got this computer hardware, then it still takes programming, but now it's this symbolic stuff. And so if you've heard computers run on ones and zeros, it really is true that that happens. But typically, there's sort of this abstraction layer where someone says, I want the computer to do this. I want to move this bit over here. Right, and so they don't actually express the thing that they want to do. They automate it in, like, this is what those tables were basically doing, like moving things around. Uh, but here are the instructions that actually implement that on the CPU. So this is our first abstraction layer. Basically, we've automated the task of moving all these bits around. OK. So then someone said, wait, assembly is terrible. We should never use it, um, except in certain cases. And then you get these programming languages like C. And you'll see that C looks nothing like assembly. What happened? We took a bunch of things that were repetitive and we bundled them up into simple commands, higher um, programming languages, and then send them to the user, and then the user has to learn something new. So we've got this, this thing where every time you put another abstraction layer on, you automate something, it typically means the person has to change what they're doing. They have to learn a new way of thinking about a problem. Because once you've sort of automated away the repetitive task, it means they're going to go off and do something random, right? typically the consequence of automation. Okay, and then someone didn't like C, and so they said, well, let's even make another abstraction layer on top of that. Let's use Python, right? Python eliminates your need to worry about memory management for the most part, and so it has all this, like, it looks almost similar to C, but it's much easier to use. And so, again, they're just adding on more abstraction layers, removing the things that are repetitive. So someone said, I don't like having to, to manage all this um, memories with pointers, and so we'll just abstract all their way. Okay, so then, I mean, this just happens over and over and over, right? All these different layers that you're building on top of, and you didn't even realize that you're using this, right? You've got all these libraries. Why would we write libraries in Python? Because those are the things that happen over and over, right? This whole mindset of if it's repetitive, automate it. Okay. And, like, the value here is you don't have to learn all this lower stuff, right? You didn't, no one showed up to class and learned. Uh, binary, then assembly, then C, then Python, then libraries, right? We just threw you in the deep end and said, here's all those things that you should know. Um, and we won't even tell you about the, the lower abstract matters. I should like shock you, right? Like the fact that you're doing things that are super complicated and you don't even know what's happening below you. I should worry about that maybe. But... <laughs> so again, hopefully I've drilled this into you a few times. Like, if you can identify what you're doing or what someone else is doing, then you can automate it. Okay. And there's lots of different frameworks for doing that. We won't cover most of them. All right. So now we're going to ask this big question about, I've just been going on and on and on about automation. What do we actually do, right? So now I need, I need your help. I'm going to ask you, what is it that we do with the Really open ending question intentionally. I don't know if they have a, one answer. So. How do you interact with customers? Email. In person. Okay. That's a good add one. Phone calls. Another 
Nobody, nobody is okay. That's good. Webinar. Webinar. Yeah. Maybe even like web, web anything, right? Web. <laughs> I want to never like type up a report or a document. I'll put that one up there because I do that sometimes. About Excel, right? Mm -hmm. So there's hundreds of web software. So this is analysis software. So this. GitHub. 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 Automating GitHub is going to make a new So the point of this is if you recognize all these different facets of interacting with your customers, maybe that it means also your other teammates or other organizations in your business or other businesses or your boss. But these are all the different things, the ways that you can interact. Hopefully this is like for to figure out where this is going, right? You could say, okay, let's see if I've missed any uh, presentation. Presentation is PowerPoint, another good one. All right. So, so <laughs> where we're going with this is if you can enumerate these channels, if you can list them out, and then you can ask the question, could I automate a thing that involves a Word document? If the answer is no, then you should think about, has anyone ever tried to do that before? Is there a Python library that could allow me to create Word documents on Python? Aha, right? Let's do that for email. Can I automate the sending of emails from Jupyter Notebooks? Right? I already gave it away to you in class and says yes. Right? How about making phone calls? Could you make a phone call from a computer? Yes, you could. Now, obviously, like there's some limitations there, but yeah, you can certainly send that. You can create calendar limitations automatically, right? Especially for like a thing that you have to do dynamically. Maybe someone sends an email, you read the email, you create the calendar device. Can I automate each one of those steps? Maybe. <clears throat> I well, yes to both. I'm going to show you how to use it. Right now. So there's a except for the in-person meetings. There's a uh, Python library for you. <laughs> All right. So 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 this is the point here is like. If you can automate all of these, you can do more than anyone else, right? Every other human is going to be limited by the, the number of emails they can send, the number of phone calls they can make, the number of Word documents they type up. You'll be limited by how fast you can type Python. Okay. If that matters. Right. The sort of thing that should be scaring you right now is like, wait a minute, I know all these different web formats and like Excel spreadsheets and like, uh, how are we going to do that, right? So you can automate all of those, right? So like the fact that someone's going to ask you for a monthly report in a PDF, maybe I should learn how to make a PDF from a Python file, right? And maybe I'm getting that data from a web server. So I know Request and Beautiful Soup, so I can pull the data down. Can I automate the generation of that? And, and, and sort of the, the super exciting thing is like often <laughs> once people start to realize, wait, you've automated that? We could make it live, right? What's better than a monthly report? A live status dashboard. Right, so maybe, maybe instead of going to have emailing a PDF on a daily basis, I could just make a web page. Can we make web pages in Python? Yes, we can. All right, think about the builder. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> All right. So the whole point of this is eventually, when someone realizes that you're sending automated emails every day, they're going to say, "Can you just make that a live dashboard?" And so you should say yes. All right. <laughs> so this is the other sort of like. Motive, right? So, like, if you send people your Python notebooks, they will not know how to open them. It's just effective way. So it means you're going to be able to produce reports from from Python. All right. So let's <laughs> let's dive into the demos. Wait, we got time for break, do Perfect break time. Before we go to the demo, crazy, let's take a break. Come back at eight oh three. <laughs> Just not show up. <laughs> you get so you get an absence and you get requested and it's like
Yes. No. Yeah. 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 And exactly. Yeah.
Super excited to learn how to automate this stuff. Like the, the thing at work is like you always want to, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to do things where I think it's smarter. But, like no, I think more complicated. And this is a dummy. Or it's not about like doing the fancy stuff. It's about it's about the concept behind it. So like I have to like like and so I'm excited to see how this works out. So I, I would advocate uh, the approach of do the dumbest thing first. Yeah. So, I don't know. so that's one that's easier to automate. Well, so yeah, you know, like, you know, a lot of you do that, like, you're the same back, and you're like, is this the right thing to do? And, like, you can build on that, but you know, like, you can do a more elaborate solution. Yeah. But I was seen the dumbest thing for a thing. But so stupid, no one would ever think of it. do that. Yeah. Oh, we need to try to solve the problem. Yeah, in life. In life. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so you, you say, what's so stupid? What's what, so stupid, no one even think of it. Yeah. So dumb. I'll do that. And then, yeah, so. and then, and then they're like, "Oh, what do you do that? Do that? Do that?" Like, you know, your customers, you know, get feedback. Like, it's sort of build that process. But I, 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 that's in response to people who like have this like brilliant vision of like elaborate processes and like things that can be done, and, like magic, right? Yeah. And they always get stuck in the clouds and they can't get down to the reality of like how I implement. It. Yeah. So that's that's my mindset. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna resume. I think everybody's back. Almost over. So, so I'm gonna dive into yet another language called Jenga, and you'll be like, Ben, we already have learned Python, right? And yes, Jenga is not a requirement for this class, but it's sort of a useful thing if you're gonna be generating HTML pages. And I'll show you why. The other cool thing is it's part of a, a tool called Ansible. So, if you ever like server deployment, you can automate server deployment using Ansible. Another thing that I've worked on. So basically, uh, and there's a, a lovely uh, sort of example on the Wikipedia entry for Dinga. So that's basically sort of like the simplicity level that we're aiming for here, just to sort of flex out the, uh, the relevance of Dinga to your work. Okay, so you, yeah, so the, going back to the dumbest thing that you could possibly do, you could write a Python program that generates HTML. That is totally a reasonable thing to do. Um, or, you know, the next sort of thing that you could do is you could um, have uh, HTML templates and then like leverage the Python data structure that you're already familiar with, and that's what we'll be doing here. So we're not going to use Python to write HTML. We're going to have Python manipulate HTML. So as an example of that, again, this is just a straightforward HTML tag. I have a string here that contains the start and end tag for HTML. The body is down here. The head of the document here. And I've got a type. And so like what's weird about this is that it has these curly braces. And so the curly braces are the thing that separates the regular HTML from the thing that I'm inserting using Django. And so where this is going to show up eventually later in the notebook is that this is a variable in Python. And so it's basically how you can mix HTML syntax with Python. Okay. So if you printed this um, as a HTML file, it will look weird, but Eventually, you're going to use Jenga to render that into HTML. So that's, that's the confusing part. 
Okay, so let's run all this. Blah, blah, blah. We'll then go. Get a string. Okay, so basically what we did in the import process, we, we imported this thing called environment. It's basically like a little mini computer for Jenga to use. And all we're going to do is going to take that HTML text up there that we typed in, and we're going to load it into the Jenga computer, right? So like the environment variable, that is uh, the thing that we're loading in the Jenga. So it's reading in the HTML page. And then this is the complicated thing, right? So we're, we're late loading in the string to the uh, Jenga environment, and then we're going to convert that content, that template that we had, and we're going to produce a new output that contains the string hello world substituted into the title. So this is like a really compact representation of like how we take in a template and then produce uh, an HTML file. So let's run that command. Oh, look at that. That looks like regular old HTML right, that we can put in a web page. And it has a variable substituted into Python. This is good, right? We can start writing reports in an HTML file. And you're like, Ben, we would never write an HTML report, right? I, I totally agree with you. And I, I typically write PDFs or Word documents. Here's the good news. I'm going to be showing you a tool that can take HTML, any HTML page and convert it into a PDF. You're like, wait, there's a two-step process here, right? We have a Python program with some data structures. We make it into an HTML page, and we can convert that HTML page into a PDF. So we're not going to write the PDF directly. We're going to make web pages and then convert web pages into PDFs. Everybody's happy. All right. I mean, you could go straight to web pages and publishing, but that's, that's a different story usually. All right. So I'm going to basically walk through a whole bunch of things that are basically flexing out the, the, the Jenga language. So here I have a text file. Again, I'm using exclamation to get out to the computer. And I'm using a command on my Mac called cat. This prints the files of a file. And then it says, so this file has some string in it that looks like this. OK, it says, you can sort of tell from the curly braces it's Jenga, right? but it's not HTML either. So what are we going to do here? OK, so we're going to load that template that we just looked at into our environment and store it as a variable. And then we're going to substitute a string into our template that we created and print it. So all we did is we changed text file. It's just saying like the Jenga environment isn't specific. You know, it's often where you'll see it. So we just edited a text file using Jenga. Okay. Now let's get a little crazier, right? So this is this is where we start going weird, weird stuff here, right? So I'm gonna look in this text file and you'll see it has these curly braces again. So again, we now recognize this is Jenga. And now it looks different. It's like a thing dot thing, right? So there's like a a variable name dot something, right? And then it has a same variable and something else. So let's load that into the template. And I make a dictionary, right? So maybe we'll just happen to choose a dictionary that has the key value pairs right, with a name and an animal. All right, so let's see where this is going, right? So, so if I send that template with that variable and render it, we can substitute a dictionary into the Jenga template that we have. All right, so so far we're good, right? We've got we can convert strings into files, and we can convert dictionaries into like, dictionaries are so powerful, right? Your whole data frame thing, that's like a big dictionary. So if we wanted to access a dictionary um, and put it on a web page, maybe we want to put a data frame on a dictionary on a web page, right? So like now we can convert from the, the the structure that we're used to into dictionaries into web pages. So now that I've sort of, <laughs> that's one crazy thing. Another sort of crazy thing that if you haven't seen this before, it's a hard concept to get from the spend a little bit of time. It's weird. Specifically, I'm going to have sections of a web page that are repeated all over the place. So one option is I could have that, that little snippet of code repeated over and over and over. Or I could write that snippet of code once and have it referenced in all these other files. So the easier way for maintenance purposes is to use what's called a template imperative. So I can have this little snippet of code, and then everywhere where I want to reference that, I can have, again, get the curly braces, so Jenga. And I can say, 
wherever I see this little reference here of include this file, I'm going to substitute this snippet of code into it. Now we can start building really complicated web pages, right? So you've seen sort of web pages have like a navigation bar on the left hand side typically. Maybe they have like a header up on top, and then they have some content right in the main frame. It's like a standard template uh, uh, web page layout. The way that you can do that consistently across all your different content pages is you can reference the same navigation bar in all of your pages and the same header bar in all these pages. You can develop a consistent layout using this template inheritance. Okay, so let's let's get an example of that. So I've already got my header.html. This is just a file that contains this little bit of string up here. I've got another file called base. And then I'm gonna load in the base. I'm gonna insert um, the template into the yep. okay. So now I've I basically combined those two files. So who here is like still confused on inheritance? It's, it's sort of like a weird concept. Parker. I'm just confused on it, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So what's your, do you have any specific question or are you just not understanding the idea? No. Well, I'm not just picture them. So say I go to the Wikipedia page for like dogs, right? And I look at the Wikipedia page for cats. So there's like two different sets of content. But what you'll notice typically it's in like picture of a Wikipedia page. It has this navigation bar here, like standard like right now closing all And over here, it has a navigation bar, all the same. So one option would be I could retype the HTML, like as a page generator, I could retype this navigation bar every time I create a new page. Or I could have it where this navigation bar actually points to a separate web page, which looks kind of weird. It's literally just the navigation bar. And then I would insert, I would insert a reference here to say like nav, and I'll put nav here. And so there's a couple of damages. One is I only type this once and I insert it. And so now it's consistent. So I've saved myself work on creating nav pages or nav, nav bars. And uh, that content gets updated whenever I update this one page. So the value of inheritance is pretty cool. So it's just referencing a common yeah, yeah. A good question. So, so there's sort of two things going on in this example. One is variable substitution, and the other is this include statement. So, this you know, I said drawing this arrow pointing to a thing. That's the pointer. It's it's pointing to the header.html file, and it's saying wherever wherever there's an include statement, just look for this header.html content. Yeah. Yes. Yep. It inserted it in that location. Okay. So. I don't know whether I included it in the zip file. Okay. 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 So basically, the takeaway I'm going to move along here from Jenga is, is that you can do basically a lot of different programming syntax like for loops. And print statements, right? And so, like, all those structures are available in Jenga. So, if you wanted to make a list, for example, so let's say I've, I'm going to look at a file that I have. Um, this is that's this weird structure. So now, now we're building on the things that we had before. We have yeah, a little inheritance here of the header file, and then I have this series of for loop structure with the curly braces. So you can tell that part of Jenga and that part of Jenga. And it's not Python, right? Python doesn't have an end for statement. So that's specific to the Jenga concept. But here you have a list element, a list item, and then a little variable name here, and then close that tag. So this section right here is HTML. So what's going to happen? Right? It's going to look at this list of things with elements n, and then every time you see an n, it's going to substitute that value into this list item. Anna. That's for inheritance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite understanding your description, so I'm going to play a different use case and see if it makes sense. So, specifically the way I, so I use this in my own work. So, 
So I have Python programs that have a dynamic number of elements in the list. Right? So like the user comes in and they, they give me three different strings. And now I want to generate a web page with those three different things. But when I went to generate the web page, like before I ran the program, I didn't know how many things there were going to be. So I couldn't have an HTML list until the user provided their things in my Python program. And so this part here is sort of it's creating the one live from the Python data. So let's run. I'm just going to run this, and we'll we'll see what it looks like. So I had. Let's see, where's my list? Right. So my list is range five. That's just going to give me the integer zero, one, two, three, four. Right? And I'm saying like the list variable is just a list of these integers. And so then when I go to print the web page, it has a dynamically generated uh, set of items in my HTML. That came from the Python. Okay, so basically all the, all these ideas of like inheritance and like that di that dynamic um, web page generation, they may or may not be relevant to you. Like, I'm not saying every data scientist uses this all the time. The relevance is if you're generating reports and you don't necessarily want to be there, in all the data from the report into a Word document or something. This is how you could take it from Python in the data structure that you're familiar with and put it into an HTML page. And again, the more common value is. That HTML web page to be turned into a PDF file. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I haven't. Had, so I don't have a quick answer for that. I'm sure that there's probably some line that does that. The messy part is that you'd have to specify the structure of your document before sending it to the to their PDF. And so, like the the question of is there a direct to PDF? Library. I don't. I haven't looked for one because I always have to like figure out how would I structure the file before sending it to the PDF. So. A reasonable question. So that's like a Jenga specific question. So I think variable substitution. Uh, so this is the double curly braces, but it's, I have, I'm not a Jenga expert. I always have to look at what the syntax is. But like once you get like printing a variable, printing a list, you know, like the for loops, these are sort of like the most common things. So use those. I don't do anything fancy. So it's definitely you know, the answer to the question of do I need to know HTML? My argument is like, let's go down here. So if, if you can comprehend this much HTML, basically like you start a document, you maybe have a header, you have a body, you have paragraph tags, and you have uh, list elements, it's almost everything, right? That's, that's almost all you need, I would argue. Like, like if you add an HTML link, you're done. Yeah. So that, that's what I'm, I'm asking. So like if, if I write an email or a Word document, it typically uses lists and paragraphs, maybe some numbering and some web work. So can I make a more complicated web page to make a prettier document? Absolutely. Right. So like the number of tags that you might have to learn from HTML might be in like the 20 range. Which isn't too burdensome in my opinion. Or the HTML. Yeah. Learning the HTML allows you to do more fancy formats. You have to have something that generates text and content. <laughs> so that, that gets into like how formulaic are your reports, right? If you're saying the same things every month and you're just changing the numbers, then absolutely, right? Type your ones. Generate the report. So I have coworkers who, for whatever crazy reason, they think it's the best plan to like email out on a weekly basis a PDF of all the graphs to all their customers. And so they have like some graph analysis of data that they've done in Python. And in order to get it to their customer, they email them a PDF. And the PDF is just a giant web page of all the graphs, and it's the same graphs every time with like 
changes in the plot. <laughs> because they don't know how to run web servers. But that's a different issue. So like, right, so like, why don't they do a web page? Then you have to own a web server and you have to know how to maintain it and patch it, right? Like, email is so much easier because you don't have to patch anything or know how it works. Guess who told them about PDFs and emailing? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Right. So back to the sort of other sort of thing I was thinking at. How do we make a, a PDF? All right. So there's this not surprising library called XHTML2 PDF. How much more descriptive could you get, right? right? Oh yeah. So I should show you something at my sleeve. That's my favorite. Bit. So I'm gonna go into. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna delete this. So everybody watch. I'm deleting the file. Delete. Now there's nothing in this directory. There's only two notebooks, right? Close that up. So <laughs> I just sold this off the internet. So I'm totally gonna cite it like a good person. That's why basically it's gonna take in the contents. Mm. Yeah, here, here we go. This is the content. So I have a really simple web page, which is like the tags I was talking about. HTML body is the other HTML body, and then there's the paragraph tag, and that's the word hello. This is gonna be a super simple web page, right? The dumbest web page I can think of. All right, so that's the web page. I'm gonna throw it in this function, and then I'm gonna send it to the convert HTML to PDF, right? So just showing it as it exists. Let's go look over here. That's it. Did I actually run it? Yes, perfect. All right. So let's take a look at that crazy PDF. Open with. No, PDF. No, that works. I'm going to open it with an editor. No, I don't want to do that. I need to figure out how to open it. Yeah, yeah, but I wanted to open it in a PDF viewer, but all right. Oh, yeah, I did open it. All right. So this is a, as I warned you, dumb, dumb. PDF document, right? But we have a PDF with a string that we got from HTML and we put it in using Python. That's the point. How much more pretty could you make this? As limited as you are by your HTML skills. So the lazy thing to do is find a web page that you like, steal it off the internet, and then make that your report. Borrow it, sure. <laughs> Credit them. <laughs> All right. So if you see web pages you like on the internet, it's totally worth reviewing their source code, copy pasting it. Right? <laughs> Cite it, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. where did I go back? Oh yeah. So another the other um, service I provide as a data scientist, and this is one of those like trivial mundane tasks that you don't want to get roped into too often. But you can totally do it in Python, so let's do it. Uh, P Pi PDF. This is a simple library. And again, I'll make sure that there's nothing up my sleeve. Merge PDFs. Let's see if it refresh. All right. So basically, I've got two PDFs. Let's open this up. And I've got this one. All right. So I'm going to show you that I have two web pages. Two, uh, sorry, two PDFs. One looks like this got giant orange at the top, and then the other thing has. Well, it looks like a Word document printed to a PDF, right? So common question from office workers is, I want to take these different PDFs, remove this one page from back in the report, add it over here, and, and manipulate this PDF to join the two, right? I think it's a pretty common task that people get stuck on. And especially if it's the same reports. So you might not be the person generating the report. You might be the person who's getting a PDF. And if you want to slice and dice the PDF into the format that you want for someone else's consumption, how do you do that? Okay, so this is just a little quick run through. Uh, I've got that, and then, all right. So basically, we're gonna do person like this. I take this one PDF that I had open and another PDF that open, and I write them. Okay, that's simple. Let's see what happens. So merge PDFs. Okay, so that looks familiar. Uh, let's get the, oh, look at that. All right. So basically, a takeaway message, you can slice and dice PDFs in Python algorithmically. Good news. That was the whole point of that exercise. 
Not in. Huh? Oh, you want. <laughs> All right. I will have to re upload the notebooks to be complete. Did I skip ahead? I think I skipped ahead. Right. So that was the three demos I wanted to show basically HTML uh, using templates and then to PDF and then slicing dice in PDFs. Okay. So now we've got uh, our data out of Python into a format that people can read. Now we have to get it to them, right? And so the question of like how often or when do we get it to them? That's totally a process that you'll, as a human, have to figure out to talk to people how often you want to report. And you can start asking crazy questions. Right? Crazy questions customers have never even considered. I'm currently delivering you a monthly report. How would you like it weekly? And I'm like, that'd be great. We love more information, right? And you're like, what if I give it to you daily? Yeah, that's cool. I don't, I don't know how you're doing that, but that's super cool. Like, that's a lot of time, right? And you're like, what if I did it hourly? And it's like, oh, that's way too much. Like, we can't read that much email. And you're like, what if I did it every minute? And like, oh, what are you talking about? You can't do that. It's like, there's a whole customer negotiation of like, once you start automating things, you can easily flood the downstream consumers of your information. So you have to make sure you have to have that conversation, right? You start just randomly sending emails every minute. Someone's not going to be too happy when they show up at your door, right? Okay. So that's, I got. Conversation definitely has. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, the other thing I've talked a lot about scheduling, but there's other sort of threshold based events. And so, like, maybe every time uh, the web server gets rebooted, you need to have a report sent, right? It's like a threshold based thing. You can use Python to analyze logs from a server to figure out when it rebooted to send an email, right? So, like, that's the sort of automation that you can do. Or push button. The last one was ad hoc. It's basically like if someone requests one, then you send them one. Okay. okay. So let's go on. All right. So I've warned you about like really straightforward sort of report generation, but it's almost none of your time. It reports are monthly, and so the fact is, well, you more often find it in Excel. And the problem is, um, you've used pandas probably to open Excel files. But you might not have noticed that that's a lossy method, right? So you lose the diagrams that are in Excel. You lose the the cell coloring. You lose the text coloring. You use you lose the font of the text, right? You lose um, the formulas that were present in Excel. So all of these things that people have literally spent years decorating their Excel tables, you've just lost all of that using Pandas, because Pandas only brings in the value from the note from the Excel spreadsheet, which is mostly what we want. But sometimes it's important to actually work with the underlying data in the Excel notebook beyond just the numbers. So that means we're going to have to do more than pandas. So where this gets sort of dangerous, so if you're just reading somebody's Excel spreadsheet and doing analysis, it's pandas is totally fine. Where it gets in trouble is you have to actually sort of hand them back the Excel spreadsheet chain. That's where it gets tricky. So like if, if I um, get, you know, a thousand columns and a uh, hundred thousand rows from somebody in Excel spreadsheet, and they say, Ben, can you do this little bit of analysis and then hand me back that notebook with the modification? We can't do that with pandas. Okay. So I'm going to introduce you to a library called Open Pi Excel. This will be your homework assignment. So that's the relevance of why you should pay attention. Let's look at that. And if, you, if you're comfortable with Excel, that's a good starting point. If you're not, it's pretty straightforward to pick up if you're using Pandas. Oops, I, OK, so I'm going to open up Pandas, and it's going to have this extra library to read in uh, notebooks. So, so let's, I'm going to look at this Excel file uh, before we get started. Mm -hmm. All right, All right. So, so here's a pretty standard uh, Excel spreadsheet. It's got one column of data. Uh, two, three, four columns of data. There we go. So the trick is this last column here, column D, has a formula, and pandas isn't going to pick that up. So that's the challenge we face, right? Yeah, twelve. Uh, as um, that, it would so because all of these are numeric. And the first, like, 
So I'm going to load in the Excel spreadsheet in the pandas, and then I can sort of see the thing that I wanted to see, like the values. That's what we're used to working with. And then you can do things like manipulate various columns. So this is like the operation. I'm making a change to the data. And then I can go, so now I've got this new column. And then I go off and I naively just write it back to Excel, right? We're done. Made the change. Problem solved, right? What happened there? Let's see. I think I can, well, let's see. I save it. Do you want to see what this pen, what this Excel file looks like? Yes? yes? All right. Let's do it. So I'm going to have to, what did I call it? I called it temp overwrite. XOS. Did I get that? Mm, I got the run. Oh, did I? Yeah, okay, sorry. It's right there. All right, All right so let me go back and upload that over to here. So we're going to open go back up here. We're going to open an Excel document because I don't have Excel on my computer. Yeah. Why would I load Excel on my computer? All right. That's super slow. Let's try it again. Upload. Oh, there we go. No, 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 no. I wanted to upload. Upload. Files. I'm going to look at the uh, version control. Three, four, five. Automation. Excel manipulation. We're going to call it temp override. All right, so this is, this is the file we just created in Pandas. I'm going to load it into Excel. Let me call it temp override. All right, so let's recall what we did in Pandas. So we, we originally read in this Excel file called week five in-class activity. So let's take a look at that one. So that was here, right? We've got four columns, no header. And then, uh, do I have a header? Yeah, I do, okay, I have a header. And then I went to write the result of my transformation. I combined a couple of columns, and I made one called Fantastic. And so it looks like the result is what exactly I want to do with Canvas. But here's the tricky part. So value, 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 value. Oh, there's no formula. So this is a problem, right? So like, so. Uh, well, it, it reads in the, uh, so here, it's just. You're going to get in Canvas whatever is in the value tree per cell. Okay, so. It's, so are we are understanding the problem here, right? The problem is the formatting of the cells, the plots, the formulas, those are not present when Pandas writes the file in Excel spreadsheet. Yes? Okay. So how are we going to get over that, right? Because so I have personally been inflicted with Excel files that are 20 years old, have 20 different tabs, and like more, almost a megabyte of data hand entered, right? And they don't want that screwed up, but they want to transform data back in that Excel spreadsheet. And so you, that's the challenge problem. Okay. So we're going to skip over all that. So this is the library. So I'm going to install open Excel. This is the library that basically is a low level Excel editor. That's the trick. We're going to edit Excel in its own language. So here, this time, I'm going to load the Excel spreadsheet in using open Excel. No big surprise. Question? No question? Okay, so this is the, we're loading in the Excel spreadsheet. Now, the first sort of Excel jargon that you hope they're familiar with is the fact that you have those little tabs in the bottom, those are called sheets. And so that we're going to access this, we're going to load in the, the Excel spreadsheet and say, what are the sheet names? There's only one sheet in this spreadsheet, and it's the same thing we start out with. And then we're going to say, well, let's make a new variable that accesses just that sheet. And then you can sort of think of this as that one sheet in the Excel file. So it's almost like a data frame in content, but it's different. So it's different because it's a worksheet. 
So you can access as many sheets are. So this would. So let's say you had ten different sheets in Excel. This would return a list of ten strings with the names of the tabs. Okay. So one way of accessing the data in a sheet is to say, I want to look at the cell content at position log. Right, so this is really straightforward. All right. Let's look at A1. That is the cell reference. So if we look back at our cell spreadsheet, not this one. So in A1, right, that was row one, column one, because it's indexed by one, not zero. Danger, danger, danger. If you've been looping through things as a zero-based list, open Pi Excel is one base. My bad. Right. Got a bunch of exasperation over here. All right. So we're starting at position one, one, and we see that the value is cool. I guess it's really straightforward, right? So good to go. So the fact that it's sort of integer based and you can access the different things using integers means you can write Python. You iterate over the elements of the cell, right? Like that's handy. You should think about that. We can access all the elements. So nine, sorry, so cool nine, seven, ten. Just check that out. So nine, seven, ten, those are the elements there. Okay, we're cool. All right, now let's let's and so just as a heads up, like you can make plots, you can edit plots, you can do all the crazy things that you do in Excel in Open Pi Excel from Python. So that's like how strong it is. Okay, so I'm gonna open up a new spreadsheet and I say that there's two tabs. Okay, I can access those uh, worksheets, um, no, positions, blah blah. So here's the big change. So the other method of accessing cells is by that name like A1. So you can access it. Two methods. One is by the row column format, or one is just by the name of the cell. So and this is just an example of you can um, manipulate both the value and the formula. All right. So now things get a little strange, but we'll go down this path just in case, in, in case people could like ask questions. Like stop. Them, right? But this is now instead of going over the row and column by index um, by integer. We're going to go over the cell names as a list, right? So to not recognize the fact that you're putting in a starting and ending point, this isn't normally going to work in, in Python. Right? This is like a index specific um, but saying the starting and ending point. And then it gives you back a weird structure with like angle brackets and like curly brace, like parentheses. So like what is going on there, right? So so these are called tuples. If I haven't talked too much about tuples, it's because they're not too commonly used, but and here, it's basically, just think of it as a list um, that's very structured. So um, that data, that big old data for that I got up there, it's a list of lists, but it's really a tuple of tuples. So the outermost tuple, uh, if I get this right, is a column, and then you have a, a list of all the rows inside of it. So it's every time you ask, what is the contents of this cell range, it's going to give you back a tuple of tuples because it's giving you all the cells, all the columns and rows in the range. Questions on that? Okay, so like let's let's run this again. Right. If I could ask what's A1 through A5, it's going to return just that column. Right? But if I ask what's A1 through B5, it's going to do that. So now now we recognize we've got some power, right? We could say the structure of this data frame and the structure of this Excel file, they should be put together in some magical way, right? That maybe involve formulas and cell values. So you can change sort of how you access the, the Excel content. Yeah. So this is just walking through accessing all the elements. And so it's so crazy, but basically it, it returns that so this this is a tricky bit of code that I'm not gonna spend too much time worrying about, it's not that important, but basically you take that big block of all the cells you got back from your query, you know, like maybe A1 through A5, it's just tuple of tuple. And you can say, what's the zeroth tuple? It's like all columns. And then what's that? The row zero, right? So it just gets confusing because you're mixing sort of like the, the A1, A5 syntax with your zero based Python indexing. So this is where people get confused. It's like you have to keep track in your head what am I accessing in Open Pi Excel and how am I accessing it in Python? And that can get kind of confusing. Foreshadowing for the homework. All right. So remember the rows, columns, one base. Python list, zero base. 
All right, a couple of people are acknowledging that that's going to be tricky. So let's open a new, so after all this run, back new file, right? So let's hope that new file is persist, persisting. Yeah, so there's new file. So let's take a look at that when we load it into, uh, questions? Nothing? Okay. I'm going to upload new list if I can find it. New file? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I think I just uploaded it here. So unlike that pandas example where we didn't preserve the formulas, let's see what happens this time. Let's see. They over, well. All right, yeah, so I had a worksheet, basically, where's the worksheet? There we go. So I had a worksheet with some examples. Uh, I set the formula in A1. Is that for here? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, basically, I can change the values. Of it. All right. Did I overwrite myself? New worksheet. All right, I overwrote it. That's what happened. All right. So basically, I had I had put the formula in here, sum one and one. And so I wrote that to cell A1 on the new worksheet called example. And then later on, before writing it to disk, oh. I overwrote it with a Bob list. Yeah, yeah exactly. With this I screwed up my own example. All right. Yep. Yeah, I just added an example. So, so sheet one, so. Where okay, where, WB. All right, so I yeah, so I ran through all this haphazardly. So I opened. So where's my opening? Here we go. So WB is loading in the work five in class activity, and then after all that good just stuff, did I lose it here? Okay, so in that work WB structure, which is the original Excel file, I'm creating a new sheet. Right, which is why when I ask how many sheets are there, that is now the original sheet from the notebook plus the one I'm adding. Yeah? yeah. Okay. So. Right. That's like this. If, if the customer is okay with a new sheet having the results on it, that it would be a viable thing. More often, they're looking for manipulation of their original data. So either like an update of the formulas or some change in the plots. I mean, like typically they want their, their original data set manipulated. And the, the way they address that is that I will never, I never will overwrite the original input, right? So like always, so this is a, you know, for the homework, always save your results is something other than the original workbook sheet. Right? So like here I'm saving it with new file under process. That's a recommendation. So open high Excel is the new year start more flexible to use than like visual basic. Which theoretically you can do this process. So yeah, so if you so if you're familiar with Visual Basic, it's like a little language that allows you to write macro for manipulation of data in Excel. And uh, it would. So if you're only making changes within the Excel file, then macros might be the better approach. But typically, where I'm working with it is I have to merge in some Excel file with something that's not an Excel file. But I'm not as comfortable writing macros that reach out to other files to look for content. So if I'm doing all my analysis in Python and I want to sort of like add in that into the Excel spreadsheet, this is how I would merge those. So just working in Excel. In, that's not in, in Excel. Right. Yeah, yeah. If you, yeah, if you're just doing pivot tables or making plots, best to stay in Excel. And that, that said, I mean, it comes down to like, do you have skills with macros 
you know, your Visual Basic team members can use those. But you know, if you're coming from a Python background, you can still use Python. Yeah. Any other? Yeah, Vincent. I would always do it. Don't like in, in the sense of don't overwrite your original data. And what, like reading from a CSV and then writing back to a different CSV? No, when you have a data frame that you might get from stuff that you already have in place, you want to manipulate, you always create a new one and then manipulate it? No, so that, so loading it independent into the Python memory as a variable, the only reason why I would sort of like preserve that original variable is if it were so big I didn't want to take the read it into disk every time. So like saving it um, as a different file, as a different variable name would make sense if I needed to make sure I could come back to the original thing. But most often you're working with small data frames where it's like a second or two to load in the data. Yes, I do. So I will I will always prep my data. And so the easiest thing for me to do is it we start run all on a kernel and just like reload the entire notebook from top. That's assuming the notebook doesn't take more than 20 minutes to run, right? Okay. So I think we're gonna hand you off to your own devices here. Let's see if I can. Not that one. Right. Slowly, we'll come to that slide. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're going to get another randomly selected partner, and the first person is hands on the keyboard. My request. So we don't get the dumb person always taking the hour. All right. So you're going to be um, get the Excel file that you're going to manipulate. So, and as usual, if you finish before everyone else, help someone else. And I think it's in it's in Blackboard. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get your partners lined up first. Then. Oh wait, we should take it. before we pair up, let's take a break. Let's come back at uh, eight fifty-five. I bet. Take a break and come back with your partner. Yes. Uh, uh, temp over right, yeah. Over here, yeah. So that so this is an issue with um, we we wrote, we wrote this from pandas. So by default, pandas will include the index as a column, and so you can tell pandas they put an Excel file do not include the series. Let me look that up. There we go. So the default is true. So just say index equals false. So let's try that again. I'm gonna go. Here we go. Demo back. No. Uh, we wrote it. Where did I save it?
However, it's in the it's in the panda section. That's right. Okay, sorry. There we go. So here we'd say uh, index equals false. Okay, I'll rerun that. I, ha I have to upload it. Yeah, I'll show you. It's not too bad. Okay, so now it overwrote temp overwrite. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to fill that. I'm going to delete these. Load. Okay. Mm, over. Okay, yep. All right, let's go back to So while you're getting back to your desk, I was thinking about what are the automated emails that I currently send. And so the two, I have two emails that I send to myself every day. <laughs> right, I send them to myself, right? Which is like, why the heck would you send emails to yourself? All right, so here's the two emails I send to myself every day. So the first, so <laughs> if, who here has heard of like Windows shared folders on network? Yeah? Okay, we have one person. Anyone else has ever heard of Windows Shared Folders? Yeah, on your network drive. Yeah, network drives for Windows. Okay, so if you use Windows and you collaborate with people in a large office, the way that people typically do that is on these little shared drives. So like you have like the X drive and the S drive and the T drive, right? Like it's own maintenance mess. But the issue is, um, so my office has been in operation for a long time, and they they just like Throw documents in the network drive, right? That's a good idea. <laughs> oh, wait, here's the problem. They've been doing that for years. And so they've accumulated this huge pile of documents that no one knows who edited the document, when did the document change, did anyone delete anything? I don't know. I put that document there yesterday, right? Is it a common story? Absolutely. All right, so I waltz in, I say, hey, I'm a data scientist, right? And so how can I solve this problem, right? The problem is, I don't know who's editing what files, or what has changed, or what's been deleted, or what's been added. So I wrote a Python script, right? You, you can absolutely do this yourself. You can write a Python script to say, tell me the list of all the files in this directory. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, right? Next step, can you, can you use Python to take the difference between any two files? Like, I have this file and I have this file, have they changed it all, right? And if the answer is yes, then I can notice that either the file has been added, the file's been modified or the file's been deleted? A couple of confused looks. So, go ahead. Right, so that's a good question. So the way that I'm doing this is I have the path to the file, and I have a hash of the file. Good question, all right, so a hash. Anyone here has heard of a hash? No? Yes, okay. <laughs> all right, Ross? So a hash is basically a very small string that looks very funny because it's just uh, numbers and letters, but it's pretty short, it's like 20 characters. And basically it's a unique representation for a given file. So you can take any size file, like let's say I've got a small Word document, I've got a text file, I've got a movie. I can run this Python script, convert any file into a unique representation of a hash. So I can, it's some number, some 20 letters and numbers that represent that file. So the value of a hash function is that if I modify the file, the hash changes. 
So if you think about that, that's pretty amazing, right? You have like a 20 megabyte file and there's a hash function that has 20 characters, which somehow mathematically captures all that complexity. And so it's not that you could reconstruct the document, but you can tell that the file changed. Mm -hmm. When I leave? Yeah, that's right. So exactly. So I, I scan through all the files, right? So I've got the file names, and then I hash every file, right? And then the next day, the same script runs, and it says, are there any files that weren't here yesterday or that are here and weren't here previously, or the files that are consistent, have the hashes changed? So I don't have a solution to the question of who made the modification. But what I can tell you is which files changed. And in a directory with literally tens of thousands of files, knowing which files changed or were added or were deleted is a huge step. Oh. No. Okay, Marker. Not the, not every day. Every, so it's a scheduled process at midnight. So, awesome. <laughs> right. So, not only do I have a thing that detects changes, right, I have the ability to schedule um, processes on my computer. So, in, win right, in Windows, so this is a, another great tip for you to keep in mind. In Windows, it's called Windows Task Manager, uh, Windows Schedule Task. Let's see if we can get a quick picture so you can see what I'm talking about. It runs at 3 a.m. or midnight or whatever when no one's in the office. Schedule. I just do it. That's a separate question. <laughs> like, no one would think of going and checking every file, right? <laughs> All right. All right, so th this is, if you haven't seen Windows Task Manager, it's just like a good thing to have in your brain that it exists. So I'm gonna try and like off you through it quickly because we're, I don't have a Windows computer with me. I just wanna see the picture, right? right. No? Here we go, all right, there's a picture. Can we zoom in? Yes, all right. So this, this is a really old sort of like style of like navigating things because Windows uh, schedule hasn't been updated since Windows 2000. So basically, you can create tasks that are scheduled on your computer, and then you can run them with your credentials or someone else's credentials. So if you don't have if you don't have administrative privileges, but you need to run a task as administrator, you can do that. So it's basically a way of saying like, I want this task to run every minute, every 50 minutes, every day, every week, every Tuesday, every first day of the week, month, whatever schedule you want. You can schedule it in Windows Task Manager, and then you're like. But what would you be scheduling? A Python script. Right? So anything that you can write it on and you can have it on a scheduled basis, this would be an easy way to do it, even when you're not there. That's that's very different than like the way that we, all we've been working so far this semester is we've been running notebooks. And notebooks run on demand by a user clicking a button. Right? So this is a, there's a there's a bridge I haven't told you about, which is basically your notebook can be exported as a .py file. Remember that from class one or two? Right, so those .py files, you can generate those from your notebooks. And then you can have a thing that goes off and runs it on a scheduled process. Okay, cool. On um, uh, Linux and Mac, it's called cron, so it's basically the same thing. But... Okay, questions on scheduled things. Right. So the other more complicated thing is to think about um, when you have a uh, threshold-based trigger or like an ad hoc. Sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, so sorry. The first one is like the structure changes in the Windows directory. The other thing is, I have literally like a uh, hundred different software things that I need to keep track of that I wrote, and so I need to make sure that they all work and that no one changed anything. And so what I did is I wrote a script that goes and runs all my other scripts and make sure that they work, and then I get a report back in the morning saying none of your scripts are broken. Yet. So, <laughs> so like basically, it's a validation that the whole sort of software infrastructure that I wrote is still working. And that's a report that runs every night that validates that my code is still working. Because I, the wor here's the worst case scenario, right? Worst case scenario is your customer tells you that your code's broken. You, the right answer is you want to know that your code's broken before your customer does. And when they show up at your desk, you're like, hey, I'm already working on it, right? That is the right answer. Because if you can detect the problem before your customer notices that there is a problem, they might never know if there was a problem. So sort of validating that the things you're doing work on your own before your customer tells you there's a problem is better. If it does not work, then it 
Bond. Both. So I'm looking for error messages and I'm looking that the output is consistent. So like, you know, did the test report the same result that I tried last? Sort of sanity for code. Okay. So this is good some like software engineering, testing infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. Not data science. But automation, yes. All right. So I think I measured once I sent about 50 to 100 emails per day and I received something like 100 to 300. So I can't automate the reading part yet, but. <laughs> That's the effort. Okay, so Outlook rules. It's the solution to life. So let's send an email. Not that one. Not that one. No, let's close that. Piece. Okay, so the, by the way, <laughs> this is a power for great responsibility, right? So if, if I'm telling you how to send automated emails, don't go off and send a bunch of spam to people who didn't ask for it, right? Like, use your powers for good, my request. Email. Let's send an email. Okay, I'm going to show you the old, old, old school method so that you have some appreciation that there was a thing before Gmail. So the, the, the thing that I'm going to talk to you about first is called SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. I to the whole idea of like HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol. This is SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol. So imagine back in the day, like 1960s, 1970s, you're inventing email. No one here did that, but <laughs> like this is the mindset you sort of have to take on. Like, how would I invent email from scratch? And then you know what SMTP is like. Okay, so the first, okay, it happens in your Python library called SMTP lib. That's super handy. You don't have to write the SMTP protocol by hand. Okay, so then I'm going to say, I'm going to connect to the server. It's called smtp.gmail.com. Well, that's, that's a name that sort of sounds familiar, right? Gmail.com, except they have an SMTP server. So we can send email to Gmail. Right, right good question. So, so these are different ports. So your computer faces the world and accepts information on various what I call ports. So typically your web browser is on port 80, your computer, uh, if it's all connections are on like port. So SMTP is on port 587. It's just a convention. Question? Uh, I think that's I don't I don't I don't remember the answer, but I don't think that's the generic SMTP port. No. I'm not gonna strongly say that. All right. So we imported it. Basically we're gonna set up a connection to the server and we're specifying where we're gonna go for that connection. Okay, so if you ever get confused and want to like fall asleep, you could read an RFC. So this is a request for comment. So this record comment from 2001 um, outlines sort of the SMTP interface. And I think this is a this is one of the more recent iterations. But basically, this is of like all the things that your email provider is like uh, telling you that they're going to provide is documented here. So the whole standard of how email works is documented in a text file. That's cool. Almost all the web standards are documented in the text file. Computer people doing things for computer people. That's what this is. Because only computer people would think, let's put the entire specification for SMTP in a text file. Okay, so the first command that we need to issue is called an hello. It's like hello, but intended to spell. So it's telling the server, hey, I exist. And so when I send the Gmail server the command hello, I get back this response. And I'm going to not read that out loud to you, but basically it's like the server acknowledging that you exist and saying, I offer these services. <laughs> you interacted with the Gmail via your computer in a Python notebook. You should be like, good job. All right. <laughs> All right. So now, because we're in the modern age and security is important, we're going to ask, we're going to use this uh, TLS. So this is your secure connection to the server. That first connection we did was not secure. So now we're going to do the security stuff. Now, when we tell the server hello again, uh, it's going to say, yeah, okay, well, like, try logging in. And when you log in, you're going to error. That's, that's the problem. So SMTP authentication error. So for most SMTP servers, this request would have worked, except we're going to Gmail. And so Gmail has intentionally turned off, even though they have an SMTP server, they've turned off the credential login of passing your username and password to Gmail. 
Now you're thinking, why would they turn off command line access to SMTP for Gmail? Because a bunch of people who came before you abused the service, and then Gmail said, oh, we're going to turn that off. And so, so basically, like, hackers and, like, nefarious people, this is, like, a really nice entry point to, like, automate attacks with. And so they turn this feature off. So it is normally a feature you'd be able to use. So the relevance of me telling you this is, like, if you have an email server at work, that's not Gmail, right, or, like, so the, the problem with UMBC is they're using Gmail. So I can't give you like the UMBC SMTP server because it's just Gmail. So basically, the relevance here is this is what you would do if you had a regular SMTP server that your your office environment was using. Yep. Mm, that I don't I don't have an answer on that. Okay. So I think that's all. Yeah, so basically, if, if you had gotten past this point, if you had an SMTP server that your work is using, the next steps is basically that you would format a, a, a text message. And so this is like a, a simple text message where you're sending the email to a person <coughs> with this content. And so what we're going to see uh, in the next uh, notebook is that this message thing is specially formatted for email. So, but that's all handled by this thing. Because there was no authentication to an SMTP server. Yep. But this notebook would have worked if you had an SMTP server. I just don't have one I can access right now. So that's one way. But it doesn't work, so we're depressed and we're like, what are we going to do? All right. Let's use the. So I think I've mentioned this before, but there are these things called APIs. So question? Okay. So there are these things called APIs. And so rather than. I uh, use the sort of less secure method of exposing an SMTP server. Gmail, okay, Google, wrote their own library for Python for you to access uh, their mail server. So the, the, the special, sort of unique thing this is. came back from a search. <laughs> that was Google recognizing it. <laughs> All right. So basically, there's a, there's a Google. Uh, extension for Python that we can include here in the notebook, and I'm going to use that to connect. So that's an alternative to the SMT, SMTP command that we were sending previously. Right. So let's we want to do this. The new so so that so like what's different about this? I have to use a token that Google provided me. So if you've ever like done two-factor authentication with your sort of web logins. This is the equivalent for programs. So for programs, I have to specify a token token that was offline and not accessible to you because it's equivalent to my password. So I, my token and credentials are not in the zip file that I sent you. You'd have to ask Gmail to issue a token to you so that you can run your program as you. Let's say 30. 30 minutes of programming or reading web pages. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this Python script that they gave me. And what I'm get, getting back is um, a confirmation of these are all the labels in my inbox. Right. So I have just authenticated to Gmail, and I kicked back all my labels that I happen to have in my inbox. And you're like, well, that's a weird confirmation. But the, the value is now I know that I have authenticated into my account. So this is dangerous, right? So I could write a Python script that deletes all my own email, or uh, sends it, you know, to a hundred thousand users, right? Like, there's a lot of power here, and so it's sort of important to understand. It's not so <laughs> Google gives warning when they issue your token, like you're not able to run reverse it. You can't reverse the commands you're running. So like, if you accidentally delete your inbox, it's actually gone. Okay. So that's all the content there. So skipping down, I have to move a little bit ahead to get to the homework. So I'm going to say, like, basically, email has this weird sort of request that it takes your string and doesn't treat it as a string. It's using base 64 encoding, so it's just a different representation of a string using different characters. I'm going to spend too much time. And then Gmail gives you this function, so we'll use that. And basically, you're just going to tell this function who you're sending to, what the message text is, and it's going to do this base 64 encoding for you. So. All that is to say, let's go back to my inbox. 
This is my real Gmail inbox. Okay, so I have one unread message there. Let's keep that in our mental portfolio of messages. Yeah, question? Question? No? Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna run this message, and the message is super simple, right? It's message from message text from Python being sent to the Gmail account, and I am assigning it as coming from this. Although this is not relevant to something, like you're already authenticated, so you can make it when you want. And the message content that's going to be sent to the, the server looks like this. So all of this, like human readable stuff, gets converted to this, and this is what gets sent. Not quite. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to send it. I'm going to say here my token. I'm going to send. Where did I go wrong? Name file went to find. Did I miss something? Did I? And I'll restart and all. Coming down the last minutes here, so hopefully I can get this to work. Blah, blah, blah. So, outside of, what do you mean outside of work? Yes, yeah. Yes. So, th this is not, I don't use Gmail at work, if that's what you're asking. This is my actual email account. Uh, well, behind the scenes, that's what your web server is doing, or your uh, your web interface is doing for you. Hmm, I'm confused. Did it get sent? Okay. I don't know why I filed that search. Okay. 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 Maybe the case. Hey yo. Oh man, look at this. I got an email with a subject and some text. Let's load a load. Booyah! <laughs> right? All right, so that's all I got. Questions? I'm going to ask. Yeah, so you have to go through the Google process of requesting a token, and that is documented, I think, in the notebook. If you can't figure it out, email me and I'll help you out. All right, so let's get that. So, Basically, I've just shown you emails. So what's the value? So you can send text messages as an email. So if you know the, so the gateway service provider, um, let's if you just look that up. Like if you know that the person is on Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T, all these different networks have uh, gateways. So as long as you send it to a phone number at this thing as an email, they will receive it as a text message. So now I've just showed you to bootstrap from email to a text message. All right, that's convenient, I think. Go back here. All right, so the, yeah, Reddit, blah, blah, blah. All right, so here's like the quick lookup table. So how do I know whether it's worth investing to automate something? You have to figure out how long is it taking me to do this? How often am I doing it? How much time would it take me to automate? And that trade-off is documented here. Like, um, let's say that your automation process would save you 30 seconds, and you do it 50 times a day, then it would be worth spending up to four weeks investing in an automated solution. So this is like a lookup table of how much investment should I make. No, 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 XKCD. You should read all the XKCD comics. This is just one of them. X, it's a link. You can read it. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, so th this is my transition slide saying, like, I just showed you a lot of Python. So if Python isn't the all end of the solution. Okay, I don't, I'm not going to show you this demo quick, but basically, if you use a mouse or a keyboard to navigate a web page, good news, there's a tool that automates all of that. It's called Selenium. It's super useful. So you can manipulate Firefox or Chrome. I'm not sure about Internet Explorer. But you can automate all of the navigation and clicking of a web mouse. And guess what? You can access Selenium from Python. <laughs> right, right? Like, why wouldn't you want to do that? All right, next question. Right. <laughs> so a good question. So why, why do we not want to use Selenium? Because if you have to go through the web interface, it means you're highly dependent on how that uh, web interface uh, appears. And so, like, if someone like changes the position of a table, then your mouse click might not work. Right? 
So like, it's very fragile, I would say. So the other thing that I'm going to show you is if you've ever used a keyboard or mouse on a computer, that can be automated. <laughs> right. So like everything that I type on the computer could be scripted, <laughs> and I wouldn't have to type it anymore because that'd be automated. Right? So on a Mac, that's called Automator. There's a whole bunch of them on Windows. My favorite is called Autoit. I'll take a look. I'm going to go over that in the class here. So quick story on Autoit. Um, when I first showed up at my one of my earliest jobs, um, it took about 10 hours to do a process. And uh, after about six months, I automated everything. And it, so it took an hour of running. I didn't have to do anything. I just started the process, walked away, and it was done in an hour. Plus, the benefit of all that automation with uh, Autoit was that, that it was very consistent. Like a process that had taken 10 hours, as a human, you invariably make mistakes in the 10 hour process. But if you're doing it in an automated fashion, it's always the same and it's consistent. So this is like when you, when you like to work with a whole bunch of different programs in Windows or on a Mac, and you have to automate everything, and you, you, know, you just move the mouse around, this is why you do it. <laughs> I did not get fired. <laughs> I nor did I get promoted. All right. No, no. All right, so there's a bunch of things going on. Homework time. This is a crazy homework. So head down. <laughs> so you're going to get an Excel spreadsheet. This comes from the medical field. So I made up the data. It's not actual patient records, but think of it as that's what a source did. Okay. So there are existing formulas, and there are existing visualizations. I don't want you to screw those up, right? I've spent hundreds of years composing that Excel file, and I don't want you to break it. But I do want you to edit it. Right, this sounds pretty exciting. Right, so this goes over the whole picture. Um, you can read that if you have questions. Okay, so basically this is the instruction. And I'm going to show you the solution. This is the only homework for which I'll provide you the solution before you've even done the work. And you're like, that's weird. All right. Huh? I, I, think, I think I provide you the I provide you the code. Here's the problem. I'll show you the problem. Let's pull it up. Yes. But it's not the code that I want you to write. <laughs> <laughs> but it produces the output. It's just not the thing I need. So I'm using basically I'm gonna write I'm gonna write uh, pandas. Excel. Yeah. Let's look at the homework solution in pandas. So basically, there's two Excel spreadsheets, and you can think of it as like data frames. I'm going to have you merge them. And so in merging the data frames or the Excel spreadsheets, it's, a, it's actually a command that you can run in pandas. It just merges data frames, and it's super simple. The problem is, if you're exploiting that merge in pandas, you've lost all the formatting of the expression of the formulas and the, and the visualizations. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to implement that same result, but in open files so that you're not interrupting all the formulas and visualizations. Make sense? Right, so let's, I'm going to use pandas here. I'm going to load in my Excel spreadsheet. Um, right, so I have two different sheets, records and patient info. And I'm going to, I'm going to basically, <laughs> This is the one line solution in pandas. And you're like, oh man, if you could just use pandas, it probably would be so much easier. So it has a merge command. It can use two different sheets, and it's going to join them. OK, so the, the crazy thing is both of the sheets have this patient ID thing. Right? And so some of them have uh, patient IDs that overlap, and some of the patient IDs on one sheet don't appear in the other. And so basically, I'm having you join those two data frames together. But the join data frame sometimes will have NANs. So like here, you'll see like this second row here is mostly NANs because it turns out that um, that patient um, did appear in one data frame and not the other. So like sometimes you'll see very filled rows because the uh, patient had not appeared in both, and then like sometimes they only appear in one. So like. For the most part, this is sort of the pattern you'll see. And then for there's a whole bunch of patients that don't match up at all, and they're down at the bottom here. There's sort of like a different pattern down here. There we go. Okay. 
So these patients down here back in the, on the spreadsheet didn't have an entry. And so like there's no corresponding um, uh, frame here. So like if you look at this this column, it's got patient ID three two three three one. And it's the same patient ID in the other profile. So when I merge those two data frames, it's one long row. So now I can make this look. So this uh, row number 496, that patient appeared both data frames. In row 497, it only the patient only appeared in the first and not the second. And in the 1074, the patient appeared in the second but not the first. So this is sort of like the merge operation that we're doing here. So this is the result. But the problem with this is if you wrote it in an Excel file, it wouldn't have any formulas or visualizations in it. We want you to preserve the Excel formulas and visualizations in the new modified spreadsheet. I think it's just an empty cell. So it's really not yeah. <laughs> this is this is what the end result of your notebook should look like if you put it into Canvas. <laughs> but this is what people have submitted before as a solution. I'm just like, no, no, this, this. Absolutely. You could write to. Uh, Pandas.2 Excel and it will write this to an Excel file. Because the formula would not be present. Like this would only write the values of the cell. In class. Alright, yeah. So this is what you're gonna be handed in your on. Uh, your homework so this has a visualization in it and then some of these columns have thing kind of quickly some formulas mm -hmm. 